You are listening to the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to episode number 10 of the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. And tonight's topic is finding a teaching job in Japan. Now, this is a very popular question that people ask me on social media, something that I've heard time and time again, and on my YouTube channels, I've answered time and time again. But this is a new medium. There's a lot of you out there, of course, who still have this question and would like to know. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, finding a teaching job in Japan. Now, to begin with, though, um, I just want to mention that I am your host, Kevin O'Shea. I am a teacher working, living in Kobe, Japan. I am a Canadian, and I am a YouTuber. So, you know, uh, I have spent a lot of time in social media, a lot of time answering questions about Japan, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. But also, it is now Sakura season, or Hanami season in Japan. Now, Sakura means cherry blossoms. So the cherry blossom season is a wonderful time to be in Japan. It is a time of year where people... Um, celebrate the fact that winter is over, um, and the the cherry blossoms are a really, really cool thing. If you ever have the chance to visit Japan, I suggest trying to come here in the spring, um, and and being able to take in the different festivities and festivals and uh, drinking that goes on with the cherry blossoms. Now it's a very um, short time. Really, the cherry blossoms are only in full bloom for a few days. And, of course, different types of cherry trees blossom at different times. But really, there's about a two-week window each spring to enjoy uh, the sakura, the cherry blossoms. And probably one of the coolest things about it is the hanami, hanami parties. Now, hanami literally means cherry blossom viewing. What people do is they go and they have picnics under cherry blossom trees. Um, it could be just families, uh, groups of friends. Or companies, a lot of companies will do this too. They will go out after work. And a big part of this is drinking alcohol and drinking a lot of alcohol. If it's company festivity, um, if it is a family affair, and uh, I wasn't able to go this year, um, but in the past we've gone out with um, my, my, my family um, and my in-laws, and we will go along. We used to go to a place called the Shukagawa, which is a river that's between Kobe and Osaka, and we would... Um, eat a lot of really wonderful food, have a couple of beers, but that's all. Now, if you're with a company, though, that may involve a lot of heavy drinking, or with a club or something like that, it might involve a lot of heavy drinking. And some of the more popular places are, for example, in Osaka, Osaka Jo Koen, or Osaka Castle Park. That's a big one. Uh, Himeji Jo Koen, Himeji, Par uh, Himeji Castle Park is another big one, and various rivers uh, around the Kansai that have a lot of cherry blossom trees. But yeah, so that's a big thing. So um, kind of connected to that, coming up this weekend on April 12th at Osaka Castle Park, uh, starting at 12, I believe 12 to 8, hosted by the YouTuber Unrested, um, there will be the Osaka YouTube Hanami Party. And again, the Osaka YouTube Hanami Party, that uh, begins at 12 in Osaka Castle Park. In the show notes, I will leave a link, okay, to the Facebook event page. Now, of course, you go to the show notes at busankevin.com usankevin.com, and look for uh, episode number 10. Okay, there will be a link to the Facebook event page. Um, it is for people who are involved in YouTube, people who want to be involved in YouTube, people who watch YouTube, or people who just want to meet some other cool people and maybe have some drinks while doing it. So that's going on this weekend coming up, so you should definitely check it out. Now here in Japan, uh, the new school year begins on April 7th. That's right, Monday, April 7th will be the beginning of the new school year in Japan. And that's everything from daycare to kindergarten to elementary school, junior high school, high school. Um, it goes all the way up. So it's a very big deal. It's a very busy time. Um, so it's been very busy for me because I have a new job now. I'm back with a company I used to work for. But uh, a new job, new location, very exciting for me. Also, my son, my son who's uh, almost four years old, is beginning three-year kindergarten this year. So tomorrow he's off to kindergarten. Kind of got some mixed emotions about that, folks. I got to admit, it's really cool to see him, you know, growing up and 
being able to have the opportunity to socialize and make new friends and to grow and to learn. But at the same time, of course, I think uh, as a parent, it's it's hard to watch your little ones grow up. Uh, and many sometimes you wish they were grown up um, when you want something like free time um, or they're being too clingy. But for the most part, um, you know, you just love having them as little kids and that kind of innocent, wonderful time is so precious. And to see them going on to school can be a bit bit tough. So um, again, some mixed emotions. I'm happy and I'm sad about that, but it's it's going to be a, a big day in our house. So first day of school for me tomorrow, um, new, new group of kids, new group of parents, um, and they can be the ones who are a little more difficult than the kids. But hopefully this year all will be well. And uh, for the most part, things usually are. So it's, it's again, it's, it's a big thing. This is the the uh, big week for teachers. So people who are English teachers in Japan or ALTs, assistant language teachers working in public schools, it's all brand new for them. So uh, yeah, pretty exciting times, the new school year in Japan. So normally here on the Just Japan podcast, I interview different people who live in Japan and maybe outside of Japan who have a special knowledge about Japan. But last week with Um, myself starting a new job, uh, doing staff training, and setting up a new classroom. I simply didn't have time to really coordinate with the guest and kind of set things up. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you myself about the topic of finding a teaching job in Japan. But what I want to let you know just to begin with, this is the perspective of one person and the experience of one person, that being me, Kevin. So um, a little bit of my background when it comes to teaching. Now, a lot of people ask me about finding a teaching job in Japan and how to do it. Uh, several years ago, people used to ask me a lot about finding teaching jobs in Korea. The reason is, in 2002, I quit my job as a 3D uh, modeler. I worked for an electronic game design company in Canada. And I moved to South Korea, where I became an English teacher, and I taught there for about five and a half years. Now, my education background, I just had a Bachelor of Arts degree um, with a uh, major in communication, a minor in English. That's all I needed at the time. And still, I believe to this day, that's all you need is a Bachelor of Arts degree or a Bachelor's degree, simply. Um, And I spent five and a half years there teaching, decided that I really loved teaching. So about four and a half years into it, I applied to a teacher education program in Canada and was accepted and went back to Canada um, with my Japanese fiance who I'd met in Korea and um, I got my teaching degree in uh, elementary education so I'm a certified kindergarten to grade 6 teacher. So then my wife being Japanese and from the Osaka area I moved to Japan where I have taught for the last six years. I've taught in international schools, international kindergartens and as a direct hire assistant language teacher. So like I mentioned earlier I've answered this question over the years quite a lot in a number of YouTube videos. But the thing is, is that my YouTube viewership is always changing and constantly evolving. And as time goes on, people aren't finding those videos that I made. And they just send me the questions on my Facebook page uh, or on my Twitter or they email me or in the comment sections of my videos. And by the way, um, all the links to those things will be in the show notes at pusankevin.com. Um... So today, I'm just going to start by talking about some of the very basics, okay? Now, this is very kind of a straightforward um, uh, explanation based on my experience. Okay, so the first thing, if you are interested in teaching in Japan, if you want to teach uh, at any level, the thing you're going to need to begin with is a university degree. If you don't have a university degree it's going to be pretty much impossible for you to find a teaching job. And the reason is that is a visa requirement, not just in Japan, but for example, in South Korea as well. You have to have a university degree. Now, I mean a four-year degree, uh, an arts degree, a science degree, a business degree will suffice, an engineering degree, Um, but it's got to be a four-year degree. Now, in America, you have something uh, called an associate's degree. In Canada, we call that a college diploma. That is a two-year diploma. That will not qualify you to get a teaching degree, or I should say a teaching license, or visa. Oh my gosh, Uh, a teaching visa in Japan. There are basically two types of teaching visas that most people come over on or work on. If you're going to be working in an international kindergarten school or uh, eikaiwa, which is a language school, it's going to be, I think, a specialist in humanities. 
And if you're going to be teaching in a university or a public school as an assistant language teacher, you are going to need an instructor's visa. Um, okay, so they're both a bit different, but they're both for teaching. And again, you're going to need a degree. Um, there are sometimes some little little ways around that, but I don't know. I came here with uh, a degree, so uh, again, that is there's really no way around that. Um, yeah. So also, people have asked me over the years, do I need a degree in teaching, like a degree in education? No, you don't. If you have a degree in history or sociology or psychology, uh, in biology, in business, in finance, you can qualify for a teaching visa. So don't worry about it. Now, people over the years have also asked me, do I have to be a native English speaker in order to get a job? Well, I will admit that it will definitely help you. It will give you a, a, more of an edge in finding a teaching position. If you are from Canada or England or Australia or New Zealand or the United States, you're probably going to have a better shot. Um, but you do not have to be a native English speaker to work as an English teacher in Japan. That is not true. Uh, well, some people think that you, you they only hire native English speakers. It's simply not true. Um, I have been teaching in Japan for six years. I've worked with people from many countries. Uh, I've worked with people f who are from uh, several countries in Africa, who are from Scandinavian countries like Finland and Sweden and Norway. I've worked with people from various countries in Asia um, th who have been working as English teachers, people from the Philippines, from China, from uh, Vietnam, from Malaysia, from Singapore. So again, there's there's some good news to people out there who are interested in teaching but are not native English speakers. You definitely have a chance of getting a job. It might be a little bit more difficult for you, a bit more of a challenge, but the possibility is there definitely for sure. Now, when it comes to the hiring process and, and, and trying to get a job in Japan teaching um, at um, you know a school, uh, the, the school year begins, like I mentioned earlier in, in this week's podcast, it begins in April, the beginning of April. That is the beginning of the school year. So most schools do their hiring. So the, the key hiring season will be in December in January, and that will be for the following April. So that's when you need to be looking for work. Now, a popular, probably the most popular job hunting site in, for, in Japan for teaching jobs, or outside of Japan for teaching jobs in Japan, is called gaijinpot.com. And if you go to gaijinpot.com after April, like if you're looking in late spring, in the summer and fall, there's really very few jobs posted. There's not a lot, but what you will notice if you keep your eyes on a website like that, is that come the end of November, beginning of December, all of a sudden the job boards will start to fill up with a lot more, a lot more listings into January, more and more and more. But once January kind of passes, we get into February, you'll notice again that the the kind of the job listings will start to dry up as since you know most of the jobs were filled. Um, but there's always things that do pop up at the last minute. There are a lot of people who do plan to come over and for some reason cannot. Uh, at the very last minute, maybe, uh, and there are people who are in Japan who take a job uh, with a school and at the last minute change their mind, they get a better offer, they get sick, they need to leave Japan, someone at home in their native country, a family member maybe gets sick and they have to leave. So there's always there's always flux. And, and schools are often hiring throughout the year. Often that happens when a teacher does suddenly leave for health reasons, personal reasons, financial reasons, whatever it it may be. Um, but again, the bulk of the hiring is done in December and January. So that's really when you got to look. And it's only once a year normally that kind of bulk hiring season happens. But like I did mention, if you are interested in, in, you know, in keeping an eye on the kind of job situation in Japan, I would uh, bookmark um, gaijinpot.com. It's a very useful site. And even if you, know, you might not be coming to Japan, I mean, your plan is to come here in a couple of years, a few years from now, um, it's good to always kind of look at that and get a get a kind of a, a vibe for the types of jobs out there, what they're looking for, the qualifications, um, and also kind of again to know when when people hire when they don't hire. It's useful, and there's also um, that website has a lot of other useful information in a great blog section. Um, so yeah, I have nothing to do with that that website by the way, guys. So I'm I'm just I'm just saying that because it's a resource that I use. I think is is pretty good. Now also. When it comes to finding a job in um, Japan, what you're going to find is that it is definitely far more competitive in the bigger urban centers to find work 
especially Tokyo. I, now, I've talked about this in uh, YouTube videos before, where I've, um, I've mentioned that there is Tokyo and then there's the rest of Japan. It seems like the bulk of people, especially younger people, like in their teenagers, people in their early to mid-20s, even late 20s, people who are single tend to gravitate towards Tokyo. They want the excitement of the nightlife, uh, Shibuya, Shinjuku, the, the clubs, the, the fashion. And I know that a lot of people, when they think of Japan, they think of like manga, anime, otaku culture, maid cafes, blah, blah, all that stuff, Akihabara. All that stuff kind of goes on in Tokyo. So, so many people want to go to Tokyo, which means that it's kind of a, it's an employer's market. It's definitely, um, there's definitely a lot more people in Tokyo like, looking for English teaching jobs than there are jobs to be had. So it is definitely more competitive. So you show up, you land in Tokyo, you get yourself a university degree and say like a Bachelor of Arts, uh, maybe no experience teaching. It's going to be tricky. You can do it, but it's going to be tricky to, to find work. Uh, trickier than if you were to go to a smaller area. If you went to um, uh, northern Japan, maybe Niigata, Aomori, Ken, or just you know any like an area outside of the larger urban areas, there might not be as many jobs posted, but it's probably going to be easier to snag one of them because, simply put, a lot of foreigners aren't interested in moving to those areas. But you know, at the end of the day, it's all about what what you're looking for in Japan. I, I really think that those outside areas, that's kind of what where you learn about the true Japan, what Japan is really like. Um, that's why I talk about there is Tokyo and then the rest of Japan. So again, it's going to be easier to find jobs outside of, say, Tokyo, Osaka. Um, but if, if, you, if you want to live in one of those big cities, you know, go for it. It's going to be an exciting time for sure. And you're going to really enjoy yourself. And they have definitely a lot to offer. Definitely a lot to offer. So that's just kind of a buyer beware though thing. I just wanted to let you know. I'm not trying to scare you off. Uh, if you want to be in Tokyo, go to Tokyo. Um, it's definitely an exciting place. Not really for me, i got to admit. I'm happy I live where I live. I, I enjoy visiting Tokyo from time to time, but I'm glad I don't live there. <laughs> it's just it's just too hectic for me. Um, just definitely too hectic. And I kind of like the fresh air and the great outdoors. And um, There's a lack of, of both of those in the greater metropolitan Tokyo area. <laughs> Tips for finding a job in Japan. Okay, guys, this is what I want to do. I want to throw out a few tips, and these are kind of common tips that I share with people on my YouTube channels and on my social media. And sometimes people email me directly on Facebook and stuff like that, and then I, I will reply to them or try to if I can. Um, and again, I'll tell you the link to my Facebook page is on the show notes, as is my Twitter. You can always reach out to me there at jlandkev, J L A N D Kev, jlandkev. Um, yeah. So the first one is. Uh, your resume, okay, your resume. Make sure your resume is written well. Have a few people review it after you write it, if, you, if this is kind of a new experience for you. Um, also make sure there are no typos. Typos can make you look very bad, especially when you're looking for a job to teach English. I tell you guys, I wrote an ebook a few years ago about teaching English, and there were a few typos in that, and definitely a few people stuck me about that one. Um, now, th that was just a hobby type thing that was not, I had no aspirations to become a professional writer, but I did write a book, uh, it's called Teaching in Asia, Tales in the Real Deal, that's by the way on Amazon.com, actually I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well, okay, my ebook, I haven't mentioned that in years, um, so yeah, that, you might find some in, you know, useful information in that as well when it comes to finding a teaching job, or at least, more. It's, that's more of like an anecdotal book, a lot of stories about my experience, more than anything. And that book, by the way, is designed for people who are not in Japan, who are not in Korea, and have never been there, but are aspiring to. Um, I can remember some people, a few a few other gaijin living in Japan, read my ebook, and they're like, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I never wrote a book, but I could write a better book than him. Um, and I, I just thought to myself, um, first of all, you're a moron. Because usually, usually people who leave trolley comments about something like that, you know, they, they have no idea what they're talking about because they've never done it before themselves. Um, but yeah, there were a few typos, which was my bad, you know. Um, so, I mean, if, if I was trying to, like, use that book to get an actual job, that might definitely work to my detriment. So, yeah. By the way, folks, if you ever get out there in the social media world, you'll always notice that the people who will tell you how to, for example, 
uh, improve your podcast probably don't have a podcast or the people who tell you how to make better videos don't have any video videos themselves and the people who tell you how to write a better book have never written a book themselves kind of funny how that works um, but by the way I gotta admit um, with regards to the Just Japan podcast I have gotten a lot of great feedback about it that has helped me improve it so I, I definitely know that on a few of the past episodes there were some serious sound issues and people pointed that out to me and I do appreciate that because that kind of feedback you know, definitely motivates me to uh, improve the quality of, of the content. I think the, the last episode, episode number nine, actually, I was the most pleased with the overall sound quality of that one. I thought that was quite good uh, where I interviewed Molly about playing in bands in Japan. But uh, I digress. Let's get back to talking about writing your resume and just general tips for finding a job. So uh, write your, your resume. If, if, if you don't know how to write a resume, just Google it. There's a lot of great uh, great resources online, um, even templates you could possibly use to help you. Okay, so again, make sure there's no typos. Have some other people proofread it. Just and make sure you do proofread it and make sure you run it through a spell checker, please, before you have other people look at it. Um, now, if you have no teaching experience at all, you, so you're, you're in university working towards getting your degree or you've just completed university, I would suggest getting some volunteer teaching experience, okay? That will look good on your resume if you even just have a little bit of experience. So if you are going to a university right now, maybe there is a, an ESL, an English Second Language um, uh, office on your campus. Maybe there is a center where uh, foreign students or international students go to help improve their English. Maybe you can go there and find out if there's any volunteer opportunities. Um, maybe uh, at a local community center, uh, maybe there are volunteers or people who teach uh, immigrants, uh, or, you know, people to your, your country, if you're from Canada, maybe new Canadians who are, who are coming there to uh, get classes in English and learn how to speak English better. Um, maybe you could volunteer there to, to help out. Um, that, that definitely is going to look good on your resume, and it's also going to give you a little bit of a taste of what you might expect um, when you come to Japan. So definitely volunteer if you can. Now here we go. Uh, appearance is a big issue in Japan. It's a big thing, okay? Um, Japan is a more conservative culture than America, than Canada, than England, than um, Ireland, than Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just the way it is. You know, take it or leave it, because um, that's how it is. Now, there, there are some very big taboos in Japan. One of them has to do with tattoos. Now, tattoos are very popular, obviously, in Western culture. A lot of people have them. Um, but they are associated with organized crime in Japan. The Yakuza traditionally have been the only people to have tattoos. So they are definitely frowned upon. But employers are aware that of a, lot of, a lot of Westerners do have tattoos. So if, if you do have tattoos, you have to make sure that they're covered up, that it's possible to cover them up. So if you've got, a whole, if you got like a half a sleeve or a sleeve of tattoos on your arm, you're going to have to make sure you can wear a long sleeve shirt that will cover them all up. Um... That's just the way it is. So, because when you when you do apply for a job in Japan, you will have to send a picture of yourself. And if if you're a man, I would suggest um, a picture of you. Wear a suit, wear a tie. Have uh, make sure you shave, or if you have facial hair, that it's well trimmed and taken care of. Uh, make sure that your ha your hair is is you know well maintained, looks good. In my case, I don't have any hair, so I don't have to worry about something like that. Um, you know, think of think of like 1950s America and, and what would be expected. Um, and you, you look professional, look clean, look good. That's going to help you because a lot of times people will judge you just in a, a future employer or possible employer um, might just judge you very quickly on the on the photo itself. So if you have any facial piercings, remove them. Okay. Um, if if they see a picture with you, if you got like a, a nose piercing or something through the bridge of your nose. That's probably going to work against you. You might not get a job because of that. Um, the large gauge earrings, too, um, those would be frowned upon. And I'm, I'm just saying this. This is not my opinion on things. It's just the way it is here. I know that tattoos really don't make the... T I mean, that has no influence on if you're a good teacher or not. Um, but, again, that's how it is. So if you do have visible tattoos, like if you've got uh, tattoos on your neck or something that you can't cover, again, that... That might be an issue. You might not get hired. It's just that simple. Um, so if, <clears throat> if 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 getting a job in Japan is something in the future that you really want to do, and you don't have a tattoo somewhere visible, don't get one somewhere really visible. 
Um, again, if you can cover them up, if you can cover them all up, that's good. I mean, I've worked with a lot of people who have tattoos. They just have to cover them up at work. Um, even like I've, I've met a few guys who have like tattoos on their chest and stuff, and they have to actually like, kind of bandage them up. So, in the heat of the the humid Japanese summer, when they sweat, it doesn't sweat through, the, so you can't see it through the shirt. But yeah, so that's the thing. Again, Japan is a conservative culture. Um, another important thing to remember is, you know, if if you're planning on coming to Japan to teach, don't treat this as a vacation. It's not. Um, you will be able to see a lot of things on your time off. But the people who are hiring you to come to Japan are paying a lot of money to, to, to have you teach, and they run businesses. And it's、um, very important that they have quality teachers teaching their students who are paying a lot of money to learn English. So don't treat this as, as a vacation. Don't treat it as a priority. Treat it as a job. Okay, it is a real job.、Um, if your school asks you, if if your contract, if your contract is is from, to work from nine to five, and your school wants you to be there at eight thirty in the morning. I mean, you're you're probably not going to get overtime for that thirty minutes, and that's just the way it works.、Um, Japanese people they have to do the same thing. So again, you're in another country, you gotta kind of go with the flow and deal with the way things are. <laughs> okay, so again, I mentioned earlier you're gonna have to have a picture. You will have to send in a picture,、uh, almost kind of like a passport style photo.、Um, they want to see what you look like.、Um, yeah, so you're gonna have to do that now.、Um, If you are in Japan, or if you're going to be coming to Japan, maybe to try to look for a job, if you're going to be having an interview, if you if you've landed an interview, dress very professionally for the interview. Okay, wear a suit if you're a guy. If you're a woman, wear like a you know like a business type suit or business type wear, formal business wear for an interview.、Um, I worked at a school last year where they were doing job interviews, and a, a foreign man walked into the school. But it was an international school, so a lot of the kids had foreign fathers and mothers. So a guy came in with a T-shirt and jeans, and the head teacher thought that he was maybe a father coming to pick up his child. And then、uh, she asked the guy,、um, "Are you here to pick up your 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 child?" He said, "No, I'm here for a job interview."、Uh, he wasn't hired.、Um, just right away when they realized, "Oh my God, this guy showed up for a job interview as a teacher, and he's wearing a T-shirt and jeans." It was just boom. I think they they gave him the interview, but the decision was made before they even sat him down and spoke to him. Um, yeah, just just not professional. Now a lot of people will ask me, "Do you need to speak Japanese to teach English in Japan?" Absolutely not, because you're not being hired to speak Japanese. You're being hired to speak English. You need to speak English to teach English. You don't need to speak Japanese. Now, would speaking Japanese help? Yeah, of course it would help.、Um, if you're going to be teaching in public schools as an assistant language teacher, for the most part, most people you work with, most teachers speak no English. So if you're in a Japanese elementary school. All of those elementary school teachers you work with, they don't speak English. It's very rare. Now, if you're in your junior high school or high school, the Japanese teachers of English they speak English, but even their abilities vary. Some don't speak it very well, and they're not around often. Often, when you need things done, you need to、uh, converse with the Kyoto Sensei, which is vice principal, or the Kocho Sensei, who is the principal. They might not speak any English, so it definitely makes it easier、um, if you do、uh, speak some Japanese. But you don't have to. You don't have to, and it's never a requirement. Okay, now、um, those are just some of my basic tips about、um, you know things that might help you find a job in Japan. Now there are different types of jobs which I want to kind of go over. There is the I mean, you heard me mention it, mention it before the the ALT or the ALT assistant language teacher, and what happens in a case like that? You are coming into Japanese public schools, mostly elementary schools and junior high schools. To teach English to the kids. Now you might be teaching all by yourself, the Japanese teacher in the room. You might be doing something called team teaching, where you, you and the Japanese teacher work together to teach the class.、Um, but yeah, that is probably the most common English teaching job. I, I'm, I'm assuming that the majority of people in Japan teaching are working as ALTs. And there's a few different ways、uh, of doing that. There's the, the most probably work for something called dispatch companies. And essentially, the way a dispatch company works,、um, and quality varies. But often, I hear a lot of negative stories. Now, I've not worked for a dispatch company, but I've met a lot of people who have, and I've heard a lot of negative stories.、Um, basically, what will happen with a dispatch company is a board of education will will hire. They put out a tender that they want English teachers, and the dispatch companies will bid for that tender.、Um, and 
the Board of Education might say, okay, we have 300,000, which is about $3,000, 300,000 yen a month we have here to pay an English teacher. So the dispatch company takes that money, and they're like headhunters. They go out and they'll hire a teacher for about maybe anywhere from 200,000 to 220,000, which is a very low salary. That's like about 2,000 bucks a month. So they'll take a big cut of that. They're almost taking, you know, I've, I've heard, uh, almost up to a third of that money. And then what'll happen is you will come in and teach. Um, but during times of the year, like summer vacation, you don't come to school, but you also don't get paid. Hmm. So that can be pretty tough. Now, you might be a direct, you know, you might get into the JET program. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Is it the Japan Exchange for Teachers? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what JET stands for. But I've met a lot of JETs over the years, and they work, that's, that's a, a very difficult program to get into. It is through the Japanese government, the federal government, um, and they, they put uh, ALTs. They tend to be in kind of the more rural areas of Japan. Uh, very few cities use the JET program. Kobe City, where I live, is one of the few cities that actually uses the JET program. Now, they're paid well, from what I've heard, about 300000 a month. Um, I think they don't have to pay taxes, and their housing is subsidized. And they're treated fairly well, from what I've heard, good things. But if you do get into the JET program, it's very, very competitive. Just Google JET program. Uh, very competitive, very difficult to get in. And um, once you get in, I believe you can uh, be a JET for three to five years, I think. Yeah. Um, and now, also, there are direct higher ALT jobs. And that is when a, uh, that is when a school board, for example, like the Osaka Board of Education, um, they want their own um, ALTs, so they actually hire directly themselves. And uh, with with that one, the uh, the pay tends to be pretty good. Um, you're going to get a lot of benefits you don't if you're working for a dispatch company. You're actually going to get proper health insurance, um, which is something you normally don't get. Um, you're going to get pension, all of that kind of stuff. So those jobs um, are better. Um, but they vary from school board to school board. Some people get very little vacation time. Some people get good vacation time. It all varies. Now, another popular English teaching job in Japan is working for something called an eikaiwa, and that is simply a language school, an English language school. And with a job at an eikaiwa, you might be teaching children. You might be teaching babies. No joke. They'll have baby classes where little kids who just only speak baby talk, they don't even speak Japanese yet, will come and, and, and sing songs and chants with their mothers, you know, in English. Um, you might be teaching adults, um, high school students, that kind of thing. So an eikaiwa, a very common um, uh, job. There are some big eikaiwa chains around Japan. Um, and yeah, so a lot of people come to work there. Also, another thing that's becoming quite popular over the years have been international kindergartens, which are essentially kind of like, a, it's a kindergarten that's uh, all the courses are done in English, and they have a homeroom teacher who is um, an English speaker and maybe a Japanese teacher with them as well. And those are growing in popularity for sure. Then there are, of course, the international schools. Schools like Tokyo International School, Canadian Academy in Kobe, um, Maris Brothers, Nagoya International School, Fukuoka International School. Those are uh, what they call those kind of proper international schools. Um, to work in one of those, you actually do have to be a certified teacher. You're going to have to be a teacher in your home country and probably have quite a bit of experience in your home country teaching before you'll be hired. Those, those jobs pay very well. They usually have a good package. You get free accommodation, furnished accommodation. You might have your airfare paid. You make a much, much higher salary than an English teacher would. A lot of perks, benefits. Um, those are difficult to get, those jobs, of course. Normally, you cannot come to Japan and find one. You're going to have to be recruited from abroad or uh, apply and hire from abroad, from your native country. And often, uh, traditionally, uh, schools like that, you're not actually teaching Japanese students. You're teaching foreign children. So, for example, maybe... Uh, you're you're an American and you work for Procter and Gamble and you've got a family, and Procter and Gamble says we're going to transfer you to Japan for five years. Um, they send you and your entire family to Japan. They give you housing and all that's paid for and big bonuses and perks. And part of that is that your children they'll pay for your children's uh, education at an international school. So again, those are those are harder to come by. You're going to have to be an actual a quote unquote real teacher for a job like that. So. Uh, those are international schools. And, of course, there are the coveted university positions. Now, normally to teach in a university, you're going to have to have at least a master's degree. Um, if you go through job ads for universities, normally the minimum requirements will say a master's degree in linguistics or TESOL. 
So um, if you do have one of those, uh, good luck. They tend to have their hiring season um, tends to be actually much earlier than language schools. They tend to be looking like summertime. So for example, this year, 2014, if there were like job ads coming up in the summer of 2014, they're looking to hire people for April of 2000, sorry, this year's 2014, yeah. So if job ads come up in summer of 2014, they're looking to hire people in April of 2015. So yeah, that's a university job. You're going to need at least a master's. Well, I want to thank you all for listening to episode number 10 of the Just Japan podcast, Finding a Teaching Job in Japan. And I hope you found some of the information uh, I I shared with you tonight uh, useful. Again, just to let you know, it's one person's perspective, one person's experience. That's me. Um, next week, I will have a guest again on the Just Japan podcast for episode number 11. So don't worry. Now, remember, I just want to remind you of the show notes. All the links I've talked about tonight are all in the show notes, which can be found at BusanKevin.com. Okay, because I'm Busan Kevin on YouTube. So most of you listening to the podcast probably know me from that. So again, BusanKevin.com. Look for episode number 10 of the Just Japan podcast. You'll find the show notes. Um, there you'll find the links to my Facebook page, my Twitter, at JaylenKev, um, as well as my YouTube channels. So YouTube.com slash BusanKevin, YouTube.com slash JaylenKev. Now, um, again, I want to remind all of you guys, a call to arms for the Just Japan podcast listeners. To remember, please, if you like the podcast, please um, leave a comment, rate it in the iTunes store, okay? Also, share share this on your social media, on your Twitter, on your Facebook, on your Google+, um, your blogs. Please uh, spread the word. Um, if, if you use Reddit, please spread the word about the Just Japan podcast. Let's get more people listening, okay? That would be so awesome. I really appreciate it, guys, if you could do that. Because um, you're all awesome, and I know... You know, you can you can help me. Um, and now, speaking of awesome people, people who've been helping me, I want to thank all of the people who've contributed, who who supported me um, on my Patreon fund, my Patreon page. So, uh, the patrons on my Patreon page, I've got sixteen patrons right now, which is very awesome. And these are people who are who are helping me um, with my podcasting and my YouTube and this and that. So, uh, there's a link to my Patreon page in the show notes. Uh, again, it's like a virtual tip jar, guys. It's uh, if, if you feel that you're getting something from the content I give you, you don't have to, but if you want to, you, maybe you can give something back. So I want to thank uh, Christopher um, for helping me out, Wanda, Bogart, uh, Frank. I want to thank Rob, JC. I want to thank Peter and William and Jamie and uh, Sabin. And I want to thank Stu and Samuel and Todd, and Robert. I want to thank Thomas and James. Thank you all so much so far. You guys are very awesome. Thank you for contributing to my Patreon fund. Thank you for being patrons. That is very, very awesome. Okay, now, um, again, I mentioned earlier on in the show that this weekend coming up, April 12th, is the Osaka YouTube Hanami Party in Osaka Castle Park. The link to the Facebook event page is in the show notes. Go check it out. Um, go there. Have a good time. Um, I don't think I can make it. I have a previous event. Um, I've got something going on uh, with my family that was planned long before the YouTube uh, gathering popped up. So so there we go. Um, and that's it for episode number 10 of the Just Japan podcast, Finding a Teaching Job in Japan. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you are happy and healthy wherever you may be. Bye.